All right, everybody. Welcome to February Recharge. Um, I'm assuming I'm coming through all as well. Video, audio, great, great. I put the notes in the chat uh, so you can grab those if you miss those. I'll try to think about that for uh, future recharges. We're we're up in our game here. We're getting to the next level. A little more professional. DJ Jazzy McAllister. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Super fun. Okay, so today uh, we're going to have a different experience than normal recharge. I'm going to let the teaching be what it is. So it's going to go longer. Um, if you need to leave, I get it. No hard feelings. Um, I like to do this and then we can talk about it. I'll make the, I possibly am going to make the teaching public on the podcast and YouTube. We'll see, not the group conversation. Uh, for me, what's happened since uh, 2008 when I really started to explore uh, contemplation, it, would, it was already built on about 13 years of meditation. And so the last 12 years working on both of those tracks, I'm, I'm ready to teach something today that is uh, something that has consumed me for many years. And what I'm gonna be doing, rather than trying to take you through this like I normally would, where we're going through a journey and we're coming to someplace really clean with a close that is a clear takeaway for you, the takeaways are gonna be built all throughout this. What I'm instead aiming to do is to describe to you an experience that I have in my words. And I think by doing that, it's gonna put feelings to things that you've sensed and felt, and it's gonna expand your awareness it's going to expand your ability to tap into your interior world, to be at your best with a calm, clear, stable mind. And I don't have to ask any of you today, have you felt overwhelmed in the last year? Have you felt the need to prioritize in the last year? Everyone I've talked to across the board has more coming in than ever before. They have more happening in their lives than ever before. And uh, when I talk through today, I want to emphasize, I'm talking about the experience of consciousness as the mind, not just the organ of the brain. I will a couple of times refer to the brain, but more what we're talking about is the, the mind as a state, as an experience of consciousness. Now, you've got the notes there. And again, they're in the chat if you want to get them. At the top there, one leader with a calm mind is worth more than a panicked team. In terms of performance, in terms of innovation, in terms of value, in terms of achievement, one leader with a calm mind is worth more than a panicked team. Panicked teams get in trouble. I don't have to give you a lot of examples from history to help you understand. It's the whole idea of the lemmings falling each other off, following each other off the cliff. So uh, just as a direct way of stating this, 20% uh, of your team or the people you're connected to are working on developing their, their state their, of being in their mind, their mindset. Uh, probably three to 4%, this is just anecdotal experience, are doing all they can. So 20% doing something, three to 4% doing all they can. And what I'm concerned about is 2020 has shown the cracks that it's revealed all of this potential for growth. It is now very popular on Twitter for people to just to go on and post about whatever their struggle is, seeking affirmation and validation, which is fine, but it's not getting beyond that to a place that they're actually growing and developing and becoming all they can be. So I want to walk you through a progression on this because if you can understand this progression, you'll really get a feel for the fact that a calm, a calm mind, it matters more than your talents. It matters more than your advantages. It matters more than your experiences. In fact, I'll state it directly like this. Your ability to succeed or fail has more to do with the way that you can harness a calm and relaxed mind at any time you need it than any other single determining factor. So a calm mind is not built from calm circumstances. A calm mind isn't built from withdrawing from challenges. A calm mind is found in the storm and the activity of the mundane. We do it in both states. So at the top of your notes, I walk through this progression and I want you to see this. It says NPCs, what do I mean by NPCs? NPCs are non-player characters. Those of you familiar with Figure That Shift Out, you know we talk about this idea that your identity fear is a movie playing in your head. An NPC is when you're living in a reality that you're more a supporting 
actor than living out your true story. It doesn't mean you're the star in a way that makes you narcissistic. I mean, you're living someone else's dream for your life, not yours. You're succumbing to the narratives and pressures of others. You're, you're not seeing the potential of who you can be. So NPCs, what do they do? They yell serenity now and try to force calmness. They yell serenity now and try to force calmness. Now, any of you that are Seinfeld fans, you know where I'm headed with serenity now. This is the way the average person approaches establishing the state of a calm mind. And uh, the brilliance of Jerry Stiller, the actor, you know, he's yelling, serenity now, serenity now, serenity now. And you know the episode and he just explodes and he yells, oh, gee, mama. And he's so fired up and angry. And it's this explosion that happens because he stuffs, stuffs and suppresses. I don't need to spend a lot of time debunking that for you. You get that that's broken. I don't think you'd be here at Recharge if you didn't. But look at how beginners try to address this. Beginners try to address having a calm, clear mind, no matter what state they're in, by trying to calm their circumstances. They're, they're trying to calm their circumstances. Now, let me just affirm, there is value in removing drama. If I constantly have unnecessary drama around me, am I going to seek to calm my circumstances, remove troubled relationships, build boundaries? Absolutely. It'd be crazy not to. I would not be taking advantage of the choices that I can make that remove unnecessary pain and drama in my life. The problem is that's not all there is to it. There's actually more. Well, what do the pros do? The pros attempt to pattern interrupt. They just try to interrupt the pattern. So if I'm having a, a, pro, a problem accessing a calm, clear mind, and, and I'm feeling stressed in a way that I'm closing in and I'm not open, and we're going to talk about how to keep uh, stress from becoming de-stress, but keeping it as you stress in a minute. If I'm in a state where I'm getting locked up and I'm starting to get circular and, and I'm ruminating, I need a pattern interrupt. Pattern interrupts are helpful. They're effective. Set your work down. Go for a walk. You know, Go for a run. Uh, you're working hard on the weekend on a big project and you're like, I'm just going to watch a movie. Uh, hey, let's just leave this conversation. We'll come back to it later. We're getting too heated. All the different ways that we say, let's break this pattern. That's good. That's a pro move. There's a time to do a pro move. But I want to be able to be at the master level with what we're talking about today. And I'm going to show you how to get there. Because what masters do, masters build a composite of awareness with the sight shift paradigm. So I'm going to put something on the board here to take you back old school for some of you that have been through, through that shift out years ago, but it's going to take it deeper than I've ever taught it or expressed it anywhere. And I want you to think about this phrase, a composite of awareness. I'm going to take your experience of your mind today and talk through it in all these different angles and I think I'm going to put words to things you felt. I also think I'm going to describe experiences that you haven't had. So you can start to stretch the horizon of what it means for you to learn how to have this calm, clear mind, no matter what state you're in. Now, to set this up, I got to tell you about the craziest example that I could share with you where I learned this upfront and personal in a very, very uh, powerful way, everything we're going to talk about today. Now, I have kind of hidden this fact the last five or six years. Uh, as I've been doing site shift full time with, with leaders and businesses, seven years now, whatever it is. Some of you know this and some of you don't. Some of you are going to be hearing something new from me as I say this. But for a number of years, I was actually a pastor. Now, my experience as a pastor was not the experience where it was a lot of, you know, funerals and hospital visits and those kind of things. Every context I led in, we bought property, we sold a building. We designed a new building. Sometimes we moved into that new building. It was very much a leadership intensive experience. I was leading them through transition. Another way of saying it was, I was helping them see the experience that they had, honor that, but also move to a new experience. So let me set the stage for you. I'm in one of those contexts. So I led in like three different transitions. In one of those contexts, we had a rock band that would play like songs from the radio. So before I would go up to teach, you know, and this was like 2005, uh, 2006, 2007. And back then you just didn't have as much of the modernization as has happened now. I mean, one Sunday I drove a minivan in and just tried to do things to, to be very compelling and engaging. So we had this rock band play this song from the radio. 
And then I taught a message that tied into that song. Now I go to the back and there were a lot of entrances and exits out, and, but I just tried to stay at one place usually so people could know I was there if they wanted to come by, talk, shake hands, say goodbye to people as they left. So here's, this, here's what happens. A person leaving is crying. I'm like, what, you know, what's going on? <sighs> that was so powerful. Every time I hear that song on the radio this week, I'm going to think about this moment I had here today and how it opened me up to something bigger. Oh, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. That's awesome. That's what we're aiming for. Someone right behind them crying. Going to get some more accolades. This feels good. You know, come on up. Come on up. We're talking. She's crying. That was sacrilegious. How could we do that? How could we play this song here? Now, I'm not the kind of person that's going to lift up one approach and say it's better and demonize another approach anymore. <laughs> Back then, you know, I'm 43 now, 25, 26. I'm like, you're wrong. Let me logically, analytically argue with you on how you're wrong. Because if you'll just believe what I'm saying, you'll have a better experience in your life. You know, thankfully, I didn't do that in that moment. But here's what I saw in such a powerful way that day. Two humans same experience to completely opposite reactions. I saw this in March last year, March of 2020. I became convinced, regardless of where you fall politically or whatever you think about things, I just became convinced that things were going to change and it was going to be a before after experience. And everything that I was doing personally with SightShift as a business, we needed to shift and adjust as quick as we could. This new world was here. We need to change fast. Every business leader I connected with, I was trying to be persuasive and compel them to do the same. March and April, I spent most of my time meeting with business owners, leaders, helping them see the reality that was emerging and fully commit to it. Some did, some didn't. The ones that did, even when they were location specific, in other words, you had to go to the location to use their business. At the end of the year, we're up around 20%. 30% sometimes. Those that didn't commit to that reality, that new reality that was emerging, they could be down some or down as much as 60 to 70%. There was not much middle last year. And as a weighted, as, as a way of adding weight to the importance of what I'm saying, your ability to understand reality has all of these different viewpoints and, and to be able to know in your mind what's happening and how to switch. This is why I want to go through this today because I personally believe 2021 is going to have more challenges. It's not going to have less. I think there's going to be some things and I'm an optimist and I believe all day long. I'm relentlessly optimistic. I have hope that any bad thing can turn good. But because I believe these challenges are coming, I want to help you as a person and as a leader build your own composite of awareness so you can be ready for whatever happens. So these descriptions, as I walk through them, they're in your notes and you'll see them uh, with some description under them. First, I'm gonna write up here on the board, the word aware, the word aware. Now under aware, I wanna talk about what it means just to develop your awareness or to start to notice. First off, we're just acknowledging the body. I'm starting here, I'm gonna spend just two minutes on this. <laughs> nutrition, sleep, exercise, all this affects things. Uh, about six weeks ago, because I tend to be all or nothing, I was not exercising like I normally like to and want to. Um, I'd really lost the focus and discipline. And uh, thankfully, Mike here today cheering me on. And, and I am back in the game, baby. I mean, I ran today and like whatever, however deep the snow is this morning, it's dark. And I'm like, I'm, my legs are tired. It was thick, deep stuff. Point of that is, I feel like in my mind, if I can't run six miles, I shouldn't run. So I mapped this trail back and forth. It's like two miles. So I started there. Something is better than nothing. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Days that I would be locked into some despair or really struggling, and I would go run. Do you know how different my brain would feel? I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but that's something to appreciate. You know, even when I was in that box, in that world of the nonprofit work and, and, and the faith work, the number of times people would struggle and I'd be like, yeah, how's your sugar, right? All that stuff matters. 
plus some of you today or those of you that listen to the podcast or watch the recording, there are brain issues. We, we, diff we have different brain chemistries and we have different brain structures. And so some of the states and the practices I'm going to list out today may not be as achievable until something changes for you. You may have uh, to get some kind of help, supplementation, whatever. So I recognize that that is true. Uh, for those of you that want to keep pressing on with me and don't get stuck there, let's go to the next piece. Observe narratives. So after we acknowledge the body as we build awareness, we want to observe narratives. Now underneath there, I've got a way of just blowing this topic out some and uh, helping you understand what I mean. I mean, what is your ability to recognize the narratives of the tribes that have shaped you, including the ones of your upbringing? I mean, just imagine for a moment what it would be like to be brought up in a completely different worldview. Just imagine for a moment that like you view the world the way you do because of some things that you've been through. Um, you know, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And uh, I've had to kind of roll myself away from some things <laughs> that were not serving me or helping me. And I know people have affirmed that because when they know some of my background, they're like, how are you, you? doing what you do, thinking what you think, having been through what you've been through. It's because I've been able to step back from my experience of my mind and consciously view it. In fact, what I want to do is talk to you just for a second about consciousness like it's a mirror. What's it like for you to observe the rising and falling of your thoughts. And where do those come from? Why do you think the things that you do the way that you do? Uh, I articulated this last year in a conference series that we did. It'll be coming out in a book later this year where I use the example like you're in a car and you're the driver. And imagine all of your emotions and thoughts as the windshield. All that happens when we get stuck mentally, it's because we're pressing into one emotion or thought and we're over identifying with it. We're making that all of our experience rather than part of our experience. And so what we're doing here at this initial stage is just starting to notice. It's like looking at a mirror. If we could just objectively, passively step back, not actively be involved in our thinking and observe it. So we observe narratives. And here's a big one. Not being afraid to think a thought that would undo your current worldview. If there is any place in your thinking where as a worldview, you have a rigidity that you've said, I can't think this thought, then you will not be able to reach the fullness of a calm, clear, relaxed mind, something you can harness in any situation. It doesn't mean you have to agree with the thought. I've tried on some clothes before that I should have never bought. <laughs> I had this funky green hippie shirt, all these neon yellow colors. Man, I love that shirt. It was my way of being rebellious and sticking it to the man, especially when I was in more traditional work. I wear that shirt, man. I'd be so proud of it. My wife is like, why are you wearing that shirt? What are you thinking wearing that shirt? Just because you think a thought doesn't mean you have to commit to it. Doesn't mean you have to believe it. And what keeps a lot of people from accessing the real momentum of the development of their consciousness and their thinking is that they get rigid and they go, well, I can't entertain that idea. You really, if you've got something that you're just opposed to, you can't have a conversation with a person that's as effective as possible with yourself or with another person until you can talk about the idea better than they can. And you can't talk about the idea better than they can <laughs> until you contemplate that, until you sit with it, till you think about it. So what's it mean to have courage, right? To observe the narrative. Second, to evaluate decision-making. You want to learn that as you make decisions, list out, and you went through this and figure that shift out, list out those top five worst decisions. What were the themes there? How can you build guardrails? Because what happens to a mind that is lost in the moment, we get swept away. My worst decisions have always been about being the hero you know, the top three worst decisions I've made through my 20s 
were always in this moment where I was swept away. Like I could, the Lord of the Rings music would start playing, swords are bandished. I'm starting to get caught up in the moment and I can step, you know, it wasn't about serving. It wasn't about making the other person the hero. It was about me being the hero. When you start to get this insight, it's so powerful. Next, what's it mean to extract meaning? Extract meaning making. Well, how does this work? Right now, if you're facing any kind of challenging circumstance or hard time or thing that has you stuck, you have a metaphor or an analogy that your brain goes to as a shorthand. I should say your mind goes to as a shorthand to try to explain it. You want to know what that is, right? Last year, we faced some changes with Sight Shift and one significant river dried up. It, as things changed in the market, it just dried up. I was like, yeah, the river dried up. I'm going to go find seven more streams. What that allowed me to do was make meaning out of a challenging dark moment to find motivation, to find encouragement, to find resilience. So that now, you know, it's possibly, I think, been the best 30 days of business we've ever had, multiple streams. Change has happened. Because I could notice the metaphor analogy. You'll ask people this question, and you try this on yourself and you try it on others. When they're struggling with something, say, how would you describe this problem? If you thought about it like a metaphor or analogy. What does this problem feel like? What does it look like as an object? Whatever you would do. If there is a victim metaphor or analogy there, they are stuck in their ability to make meaning. They're going to loop around not being able to make effective decisions, take effective actions. Next, recognize when your mind is distracted into fantasy thinking into your future or regrets thinking into your past and what that reveals. So again, this is about awareness. This is about the mirror. Learn to not over-identify with fantasy thinking. Learn to not over-identify with regrets thinking. Just notice it. Oh, I really keep thinking about that a lot. I keep having that thought pop up. Because as you start to notice that, you are building your awareness. So what we do when we get aware, OG sight shift stuff here, when we talk about it and figure that shift out, we're talking about awareness of what? Proving or hiding. I'm proving, I'm hiding. All of what I'm talking about today could fit under with this piece right here of awareness under this idea of proving or hiding. Now, after we do that, we lean in, we get aware, we lean in. So let's break, through, break down what it means to lean in. After I notice the proving and hiding, what am I doing? I'm finding the drivers. So that's that first one there. Find the drivers. Find the drivers. Here is the most powerful thing that you could tell others, if for any of you that teach sight shift. When you stop being driven by your identity fear and the proving and hiding relaxes, the insights don't get crowded out anymore. See, what we're doing when we lean in we're aware of the proving and hiding. We lean in and we want to find those drivers. What are those drivers? It's our identity fear. And we loop around on that. That's the movie playing in our head all the time. And until we're aware of that movie, until that movie rewrites itself into a healthy direction, us accessing our most creative insights, us accessing the, the, the stillness, the quiet, the, the voice within, whatever you want to call it, we're cut off from that. This is a wild story. I've told it to a few of you that I'm in, in regular meetings with. Last week, uh, I had a meeting that uh, was tough. And then that night, it just I could just hear it. I, I put earplugs in when I sleep because I'm crazy. And because my kids are old enough to walk themselves into my bedroom if they need me, right? So I can do that at this stage. But I put the earplugs in and then everything around me just went totally quiet. And as it went totally quiet, I just heard something, just this little peaceful, hey, this is going to happen tomorrow. And it would have been a bad news thing. I wake up the next morning, I open up my email, boom, that bad news thing is there. I was prepared for it. Now we were able to get it back on track and it's okay. But the, the intuition, the insights, these leaps, they don't get crowded out. What, do you, what else are you doing when you lean in? 
and you notice these drivers. You, you can recognize the influence of shame. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this one. You're here because you get that. Next, knowing your motives or why you want to do what you do. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. We know that from figure that shift out, but it's a good reminder that you're not actually noticing your consciousness. You're not removing yourself from putting yourself into the windshield. You're not looking at the mirror passively and observing it unless you can actually understand, oh, why am I wanting to do that? I'm wanting to do that because it'll comfort my identity fear or because I truly want to show up, serve, and impact. Next, learn the feel of your processing. Learn the feel of your processing. I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time here because this is some, some rich stuff that's been giving me a lot of uh, um, just benefit and impact lately. And the reason is because when you're in a high feedback environment, when you're in a new territory, and I've been in new territory with SightShift the last six months, when you're in new territory, you're getting a lot of uh, new signals and cues and new pattern matching. And here's the, here's the thing. Everybody wants to posit the battle as between analysis and emotion. So emotion is the enemy. We need more analysis. Oh, you stuffy. Microsoft guy, right? The Microsoft versus PC. You need more emotion. In fact, you could look at that those commercials, the reason they were brilliant, it was a stereotypical presentation of this battle. And it was like, well, you're, you're more of the emotional creative. If you buy the Apple, you're not the analytical stuffy. However, we all know this, that at some point in your life, you have to mature beyond being driven by your emotion to logical, rational analysis. The problem is, and it's what makes adulthood suck so much and why so many people don't want it is because they stop there. They don't progress to the next stage where they live with the integration of the emotional and the analytic. We want both. So OG site shift stuff here, I'm not dominated by my emotional state. I'm not denying it. I'm aware and leaning in and learning. I'm paying attention to what's happening here. Well, here's what's happening to Chris McAllister this year. I'm actually having to form new intuition because I'm in a new environment. You will not get as far as you can go in your leadership until you learn how to recognize your intuition and when it's good and when it's bad, when it's driven by shame and when it's driven by an abundance of an overflow of joy, love, and how you want to serve the world. Likewise, You'll get into new territory at some point if you keep growing and learning, and your intuitive sense has to be redeveloped. The number of business owners and leaders, I mean, really, this is like crazy to me that I've worked with for years and years and years. They really don't have to make a ton of changes to grow like crazy. It's just so often those changes aren't intuitive to what got them there, but what got them there to that point, won't get them to that preferred future. And oftentimes what'll get them to that preferred future, right, is developing new intuition. They're in a high feedback environment. So we have to learn the feel of our processing and where we are. We want to learn the feel of our rational mind. You can see this in the notes and your intuitive mind and how to let your intuitive mind lead the way with your rational mind supporting you. Now, I've talked about this a couple times this last year in different contexts. So I'll articulate it this way real quick. This is shorthand for how I experience it. Brain, they'll find a better way in brain science to experience it, but, or to express it. You, you start out, you're just all right brain. And then at some point you get logical, rational, you develop left brain leads the way, but then right brain atrophies. The most powerful, effective leaders, the most successful, the most dynamic, all of that, learn how to build their life around some leaps of insight, okay? In other words, the right brain breaks through with some kind of truth telling at some moment. The happiest and most fulfilled people learn to shift that dance so that the right brain is leading by just a second or a few seconds so that they're able to be open to what's going on. I'm gonna to talk to you about what, being open about what's going on in a second. Right now, I'm just describing it. It's the difference between the hum of proving and hiding, this is in your notes, as a running consciousness in the background and what's really there. So when proving and hiding is consuming my consciousness, what can I not do? Notice what's actually happening and then lean into it. I talked to you about business owners last year 
that could commit to reality and move on and those that couldn't. You suffer right now in your life because you're resisting something. You want a reality to be true that just isn't. And the quicker that you can lean in and learn the feel of your processing and how you're frustrated, you're, you're upset that it's not going the way you think it should or you want it to. You're just not acknowledging the way the game is being played. You're not acknowledging what's happening. Where are the results? Are you happy with the results? How can you shift reality to get to the results you want? I understand it's not that simple. You know, this is why this next year I hope to release two books, actually. One on this process that I was referring to earlier, two, which is a really weird book that I just wrote over the course of a day that I couldn't not write, that I let somebody read it. I won't name his name, his name. it rhymes with Rhett. Um, and uh, he was like, Chris, this is crap, don't put it out. No, it's just a crazy little thing that I had to try. But it's all about this idea when you're committed to something and you can't think a new thought. When you're committed to something and can't think a new thought, that proving and hiding that, that's operating all of that conscious energy in you, you can't commit to the new reality that's emerging and move on. And here's the thing, new reality is always emerging. I could couch this in a lot of different ways. One of my favorite ways is just to think about how the edge is where life is always happening. The, the developing edge. If any of you come from this, from a, from a, you know, maybe a, a background of spirituality or religion, it's, it's where the sacred is at, right? It's just this edge. I want to run to that edge because that's the place where I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm expanding and I'm becoming more. And here's the really cool thing. Reality as it is, is so freaking beautiful. I talk about this and figure that shift out. And I've kept cultivating it since I wrote about it there, but I haven't talked about it publicly. You know, my daughter's now 18, 16, 15. Just a couple nights ago in the kitchen, I had my 15-year-old. I gave her a hug. And I hugged her for the first time. Now, do I literally mean for the first time? No, but I mean consciously. I saw her as she is right now for the first time. A statement that I made years ago on a podcast, I still stand by, if you can't look at a blade of grass and get jacked up, something's off. That's not a shaming comment. It's just that if we can't keep seeing reality for the first time, it's because the hum of consciousness that is in the operating background of our mind is so consumed with proving or hiding. The purity, the gratitude, the joy of what this real experience that's happening now can't break through. So there's so much more. Next, be able to sit with tension. This is the next idea there in your notes. Sit with tension. How do we do that? Well, you can practice meditation by noticing awareness of consciousness and eventually seeing thoughts arise and fall as you know yourself as consciousness. I don't mean that sentence to be recursive. <clears throat> Let me state it this way. In your growth and learning, there's, there's practices you can do, meditation, where you just passively observe your thinking. You let go of all effort to think, but also don't let yourself be lost, lost in thought. You let go of the attempt to think, but also you don't let yourself passively be lost in thought. In other words, you don't keep following those thoughts as they go. It's not that you do this all the time. This is just a practice to experiment with. Instead, you just observe, oh, look at that thought that's just occurred. Let me let it go and let it pass. I don't need to keep thinking or ruminating on it. One effective tool that can happen for this or effective way of doing this is you can come back to breath. Just come back to breath. I thought, you know, this is called mindfulness meditation, a lot of different ways to describe it. I've practiced a lot of different styles. I, I'm constantly experimenting with things like this because I want to learn and grow. And I could describe it a lot of different ways. You figure out how to experience it for yourself. But when you do that, what you can start to do is recognize I don't have to get tense over my thoughts. I don't have to harden. I have to give a shout out to uh, one of our certified coaches. She's a business owner. She made changes last year. They were able to grow in the midst of the crazy. Uh, her name's Whitney. I didn't see everybody that came on. I'm not sure if she's here, but uh, she sent me something she wrote and it was so powerful. I want to share it with the email list sometime this year, but she wrote this sentence and it just said, it's okay to soften. It's okay to soften, right? I loved that because we think we get there by getting rigid. 
and getting hardened. No, we soften, we sit with the tension. What's it mean to keep your mind wide open to possibilities and not close in prematurely? A lot of puzzles and riddles are meant to keep your mind open to possibilities. We close in on a reality that makes sense so fast. This is why the human brain believes in conspiracy theories. Because we can't sit with tension. We can't acknowledge reality is complex. It feels overwhelming. And so because it feels overwhelming, we lock in and we lock in and we commit to something that we can make sense of rather than seeing it is complex and there's multiple variables. What's it mean also to hold ideas that oppose each other in your mind at the same time and see truth in both? You know, for those of you that lead, should you get up and walk around and be with your team, depending on whatever's happening with the regulations in your world today? Uh, should you text your team and see how they're doing? Or should you shut everything off and work on your strategy and, and do some deep focused work? Well, of course, the answer is both. It depends on the timing. And this is a really deep way of saying this. And if you want to get my heartbeat on it, look at the paragraph at SightShift.com, our guiding values. We call it the electric middle off of F. Scott's, F. Scott Fitzgerald's quote where he said, the beauty of a first-rate intelligence is you can stand in the electricity two opposing ideas create. You don't pick one or the other. You don't try to be balanced. You accept them both. When your thinking can be both form and formless, when you can approach things and understand this idea of sitting in the tension of both, you get the electric middle. I, could, I feel like I could talk for like an hour about that, but we're not going to do that. And you're hanging. And I love this because I told you today would be different. I'm like, you know, describing this composite awareness. So now we're going to get to the next piece. This is, we've described leaning in. Now we want to talk about the next piece to flip. Now I'm going to put a word under flip that I used to use prior to 2015, but I have more courage now. Scratch that. I'm crazier now. And I'll tell you what I wrote if you can't see it. The word is flip and the word underneath it is receive, receive. Here, all of Sight Shift can be organized under two ideas, identity, mission, community, okay? If you're suffering, you're building your identity around your mission community. Cooperate with what's unfolding in your life. How do you cooperate with what's unfolding? Well, it starts with building the mirror of awareness. I get aware and I lean in. Now, after I lean in and practice what we've talked about, now the moment can change. How does the moment change? Well, it flips. I'm not afraid of going and having that conversation with that person. I become excited at the growth opportunity that could happen, right? The moment flips. I'm not trying to get my identity from you. I'm coming to give you something out of an abundant identity. Let me go deeper. The word receive underneath here. This is what I was talking about. When your right brain gets one second ahead of your left brain, now you're open to the intuition. You're open to the download. You're open to receive. Where are you receiving it from? Well, go listen to polycontemplative.com. We can't cover that today. That would take us in a whole other path. <laughs> That's a crazy thing to talk about. But I can describe it for you. So I want to describe it some. Under flip, first piece, stay open. Stay open. How do you stay open? First, you want to cultivate mental states of imaginative contemplation for insight and breakthroughs. Cultivate mental states of imaginative contemplation for insight and breakthroughs. Hey, what do I mean by that? Let's go OG style. Practice identity space. Practice identity activity. Practice the table exercise. I had a coaching session with somebody Friday. Me being coached, not me coaching, because I always got to grow and learn and work on myself. And this guy was really good at getting me to say out the truth. And, and we got something, we have something so exciting coming up with Sight Shift. I'm not going to tell you about it yet, uh, that I'm so lit up about it that I basically was, this guy got me to say out loud what I was feeling, which was, would you just tell me the marketing silver bullet to use here so everyone will like me and use this? Just tell me who to be so everyone will like me and then we can help them change the marketing piece of this. And as that came out, I was like, oh, there might be something there to work on, Chris. <laughs> Tell me who to be sounds like identity fear worth equals performance. So I made a note of it. And I made a note of it because I knew that I wanted to go back and do the table exercise and invite that part to the table. And um, full weekend, crazy, didn't have time to do it till early this morning and did it this morning. Welcome that part of me to the table. 
had that conversation with him like we teach in section seven to figure that shift out and the insight, the breakthrough, the cohesion that I can now harness that part of me without being defined by that part of me. Please tell me you know the difference between receiving thoughts and directing thoughts. I need to do both. If I've got a project to work on, I need to direct my thoughts towards that project. But as I direct my thoughts toward that project, I might receive insights in it. Two different things. So I can direct my attention and I can keep it open to receive. You say, Chris, I don't fully know what you mean and you're not explaining it enough for me to get it. Well, that's why we're doing this recharge today, because I know that this is me trying to say a lot over the last many years that I'm still figuring out how to describe in the best ways. So you'll help me do that, no doubt, by your thoughts or questions when we get to that. Knowing when to change your mind and when to stick to your viewpoint, there's a time to do both. If you're always the kind of person who changes your mind or always sticks to your viewpoint, you're not really open. I want to know, when was the last time you stuck to your viewpoint against the crowd? When was the last time you changed your mind on something? Both of these are powerful questions. Um, I, I want to go for a little bit on this, and this is some wild stuff, but I need you to appreciate how the brain uses classification and categorization, but not let it limit your understanding of any topic. What do I mean by that? Um, Poetry sometimes can just say something that I can't say. Music lyrics. How many times have you listened to a song and you're like, oh man, they put to the words, the feelings I'm having perfectly. The human brain, when it's you know, emerging, growing and developing, we learn to categorize. We, we call things what they are. One teacher uh, said it this way, the day you teach the child the name of the bird, the child will never see that bird again. So it's this beautiful thing they're experiencing for the first time. Once we categorize something, we kind of get done with it, which is why I was talking about what it means to see my child for the first time again and again and again and again, what it means to feel gratitude for this day in a fresh way that I couldn't feel yesterday. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher said, what labels me negates me. So when we can label something, we take out so much of its value. This is why Buck's, Buckminster Fuller, the inventor of the geodesic dome, said, I am a verb. He actually wrote a book on it. I love this because this gets identity out of roles and relationships, just nouns and categorizations, into this statement of dynamic being. And now, what does this have to do with this, uh, this idea of receiving? Well, it's tied into this understanding that you might currently classify or categorize an emotion, a thought, a belief, an experience in some certain way today, but don't let that calcify in a way that you're not open to a new experience of it tomorrow. See, this is uh, what I learned when I was like 20 years old. I had, I actually minored in what was called Koine Greek. That's what the New Testament was written in. And I had a professor who had uh, he was a Danish professor, so English was a second language, and he was brilliant. And anytime we would interpret a passage, and I could sight read the Greek New Testament by 21 because I wanted to read it for myself. Anytime we interpreted a passage, he would make us list out the things we already believed before we even read it. You'd get to three, and he'd push you to five, to seven, then to nine. You're like, I can't get any more. Then he gets you to 11, and to 13, and to 16. It was an insane experience seeing I already had categorized things in my mind, assuming that I knew, so I couldn't have the moment flip. I couldn't receive in a fresh way something that's there. They've learned now that it's really not an effective way to describe light as a wave or a particle because it's both, but then it's also neither. And there was a physicist in, at the quantum level, David Bohm, I think 20, 30 years ago said, uh, hey, what if, it's, what if we're categorizing it wrong? What if it's energy and information? The very way that we even tackle the fundamental questions of our existence is affected by this idea of what it means to be open, to not be in a place that we're rigid or stuck, but instead be able to see something different. Next, I want to make sure you get this. Look for the opposite. Look for the opposite. When your intuition is a leap of insight and when your intuition is wrong. Now, I've already kind of hit that for a second, but let me just go a little bit. Uh, with this. What is your dominant style? 
Is your dominant style to go with your intuition? Then pause for a minute and observe what's your motive. Is your dominant style to skip your intuition? Then start going with your intuition more. In fact, as a direct takeaway or a challenge, I want you to find one thing today. And if you don't normally follow your intuition, follow your intuition. If you normally do, I want you to pause and just consider for a moment. Just look both ways, take a breath, and then go. All you're doing by doing that, and there's so much more we could say about it, all you're doing by doing that is starting to open up your ability to think slow when you want to think fast and to think fast when you want to think slow, which sums up the largest academic book that's ever been written on thinking that was super successful, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. I just summed up the whole book for you. And the problem with the book, though, is it so overpraised getting beyond intuition, because intuition can be so faulty, into logic and analysis, but it didn't talk enough about how to get to a place of this relationship that I've already covered between analysis and emotion, when to intuit and when to not. Um, next, continue until it's action-based but shame-free. What? What do I mean? Your mind, your experience, your thinking. You want to continue with it until it's action-based but shame-free. Your ability to commit to a line of thought and take action, to commit to a reality and move, is directly connected to how many lifetimes you'll have. I, for too many people, the human experience is years and decades that are on repeat. How many movies have been made about this, right? And, and I want to live the kind of life that takes what I'm thinking and processing into a place that's action, free of shame, and then we'll see what's next. I can't imagine fully what my life will look like post 50 right now. Why? Because twice what I saw my life looking at 74 like, I got there. I mean, I remember this guy saying to me when I was like 28, man, I can see you. And he was throwing this picture out there. I was like, yeah, that's what I'm going for. And then I got there. And then seven or eight years later, I could see another picture. And then I got there. For too many people, we've settled into this reality that this is all that there is, and we stay stuck there. So we want to continue till it's action-based but shame-free. Let's go to the next piece. Flow is the word I'm writing. Flow. And the word that I put underneath is rest. Rest flow, then rest. Flow is a state of being when I have a relaxed and harnessed mind. I'm receiving through my right brain. My left brain is providing the scaffolding and the infrastructure to my thinking. And as I receive through my right brain, I can then enter into a state of rest. It's a state of flow. Today was experimental to do the recharge this way. I have felt in a state of flow while I do it. I'm excited to be here, but there's a state within me that feels a lot of peace and rest to just share these ideas with you. So it's not just even in this though, it's also sitting on the couch last night. We were watching one of the new Avengers movies. I was critiqued by one of my children on something and they were right about it. And I sat there and I thought, hmm, little ego Chris wants to rise up and defend himself. He wants to fight the good fight and logically fillet her with these brilliant arguments that are gonna leave her in a smoldering ash of ruins that I hope at some point later on in her future, 20 years from now, she will tell a counselor, I was traumatized and here's where it began. But little ego in me was like, you know what? You feel insecure about that? Relax, it's an illusion, it's false. Your identity isn't on the line. And there's a flow, there's a rest. So it's in the mundane and it's in the big. How do we do this? We harness states through triggers. The power of combining relaxation with the stimulation of flow. This is the identity activity. This is what we teach you and figure that shift out. Positioning your mind and body for multi-sensory positive trigger building with intention. Come on now. Why am I taking a cold shower after I run? I'm building those multi-sensory triggers. I don't have a sauna at the house right now. Uh, if, if my friends from Finland are listening to this, we worked with them a number of years ago. We're doing some work with their company. They sent me a book on sauna for Christmas to rub it in my face. They're like, look at all these saunas. 
So I'm having to find a different way to do it. I'm doing the super hot bath, cold shower. I need to order one. We keep investing in the business. Need to get one soon. But until then, that's my short-term hack and how I'm closing my day. I'm building a multi-sensory triggered experience so that I can channel switch and be fully present with my family no matter what's going on. Last, here's a question for you. And then I'm going to talk to you about this overall picture and then we'll be done. But last on your notes here, what haven't I said? What haven't I said? I'm not trying to be the end all be all in this. I'm just a crazy freak who loves this stuff and studies it and notices it in my life and notices it in working with lots of other people. But how can we understand that we're experiencing our conscious mind, but do it without the limitations of whatever current analogies are used to explain the brain? We always in human history as we've been writing, which isn't that long, have written and described the brain using the analogy of whatever was our most modern form of technology. Right now we think about the brain as a computer. And, and so then people confuse brain and mind. I'm talking about brain, organ, mind, consciousness, experience. All I'm saying with this is we don't know. Hey, what if we find out years from now that unconscious, subconscious, and conscious, there's actually not three levels, there's nine levels. We could. How would I even have that thought? No kidding. This morning when I woke up. And, and sometimes when I wake up, I'll feel my brain kind of like light up the more I pay attention and try to study this stuff before my eyes open, sometimes it feels like a light gets turned on. This morning, it was like nine different screens. Some of them were turning on, some of them were turning them off. I was like, what if there's like nine levels of consciousness and these are all just getting fired? That's a stupid, crazy idea. Who knows? It could be totally wrong, but it's not like through human history, we've always had breakthroughs, logical, analytical, step-by-step. -step. It's always a leap. It's always insights. You can study the guy who popularized this. Uh, I can't remember his name now through a book, Charles Kuhn, I think. Scientific breakthrough doesn't come iteration, 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 iteration. We leap into a new way of understanding iteration, iteration, iteration. Then we leap into a new way of understanding. Oh, the sun is actually in the center, not the earth. These leaps into new understandings. And I believe we've barely tasted the edge of what we can experience with our mind. Now, here's what I want to make really clear about this. I'm writing this right now on the board, mirror and as the mirror, okay? Let me explain what I mean. When I think about sight shift, what we're doing, we get aware, we lean in, the moment flips flow. You know this, you can go through this experience 17 times in a day in micro ways. You can go through it in macro ways over the course of you could go through it two times in a big way with your relationship with a partner, love, interest, or spouse over the next five years, okay? But the first half of this is noticing your consciousness. You're observing it. The second half of this is experiencing it. You're not just noticing the consciousness. You're experiencing the consciousness. You're receiving and you're in flow. And the, the, the fault of so much training around having a calm and harnessed clear mind breaks apart at two levels that I'm trying to debunk. After you, the beginner pro master stuff that I said at the beginning. Place one is it doesn't do enough with noticing consciousness. It's just all about getting into the flow state. The other ditch they make it all about noticing consciousness, mindfulness, but not upgrading the mindset. We want to do both in. And it's ever ongoing, never ending. I notice the mirror and I experience as the mirror. My mirror being the me, the consciousness, everything as it shows up. See the mirror and be the mirror. Observe and understand. This is the noticer within. Then redirect and receive here. This is the experience of consciousness. I'm noticing and I'm observing. I'm redirecting. You guys are champions. I sense this might happen. I'm going to 